Bonjour, bonjour à toutes et tous, je suis Emmanuel Tiblou, le directeur de l'école des arts décoratifs. Je suis très heureux de vous accueillir ce soir dans le, pour notre le deuxième le conversation dans le cadre du cycle Parole de créateurs face à l'urgence climatique en, en collaboration avec la fondation Tali, dont je salue le, la fondatrice et la présidente Nathalie Guillot. Le, que je remercie le, à nouveau le, de cette le, collaboration avec nous. Euh, nous sommes très heureux euh, ce soir d'avoir un plateau le, de très grande qualité avec le sociologue le, qui est le, là, Richard Sennett, et l'artiste Irène Koppelman, que je vais laisser à euh, Stefano Vendranim et Anna Bernagozzi, qui seront les deux animateurs de la soirée, le soin de présenter. Euh, juste un mot sur l'intitulé de cette rencontre, « Coopérer avec le vivant », qui euh, euh, indique une nouvelle forme de relation avec le vivant pour l'humain, qui a plutôt eu tendance, c'est toute l'histoire de, de l'humanisme, toute l'histoire de la modernité, qui a plutôt eu tendance à s'accepter du vivant, à s'arracher à sa condition euh, le vivante et à sa condition euh, le terrestre, et nous prenons conscience euh, le, en, ce, en ce moment, depuis ce qu'il est convenu d'appeler euh, notre condition anthropocène, ce concept d'anthropocène étant euh, inventé au début euh, le, des années euh, le 2000, nous prenons conscience de la nécessité d'engager d'autres relations, autre, une autre, un autre rapport avec le vivant, et la coopération est une façon de nommer ce rapport qu'il convient aujourd'hui d'entretenir avec le vivant, un rapport autre que celui que nous a légué la, la modernité, que nous ont le, légué le, les lumières. J'imagine que c'est ce, de ce sujet ou de ce genre de questions qu'il sera euh, question. Euh, c'est à toi, donc euh, Stéphano. Je vous souhaite une excellente soirée et vous redis la, notre joie de vous accueillir. Merci beaucoup Emmanuel. Vous m'entendez Très bien, ok. Bonsoir, euh, je vais faire cette conversation en anglais, vu que nos deux intervenants sont euh, anglophones. Donc, euh, good evening everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. So before starting, I just wanted to say a few words about the program Créateur face à l'urgence climatique ou uh, Creators Facing Climate Emergency. Uh, so my name is Stefano Vendramin. I'm a curator and the programmer of this series. Uh, which has been initiated and uh, by the Fondation Tali, as mentioned by Manuel, uh, which is a foundation based in Brussels, an art residency uh, created by the collector and author and publisher and curator Nathalie Guillaume, who is here, and uh, which is of course par organized in partnership as well with l'Ecole des Arts Décoratifs, uh, where we're here today. And uh, so the Fondation Tali has three main missions. The first one is to promote uh, women in uh, female artists. The second is the place of arts and crafts uh, and the connection between the two. And the third thing is uh, the role of artists as well in the climate emergency, uh, So, which is obviously the topic for today. So we need a paradigm shift towards a more sustainable and respectful way of living in the world today. And it's very difficult for us to create a new future without having been able to imagine it first. And that's why this program since 2020 has been inviting artists, designers, scientists, and thinkers to discuss their work, their research, and their ideas and possible solutions. And, uh, and the objective of these dialogues is also to accompany a new generation, a young generation of artists and designers, like those in the room today, those at the Ecole des Arts Décoratives, Uh, who are having, who want to evolve their practice with these same issues in mind. And, uh, and so just for some context, we've had uh, last month, we had Tino Segal speak here. We have Ernesto Neto, Emanuele Cocha, uh, Fabrice Iber, Claudia Conte, Rosella Biscotti. Many, many uh, artists uh, pa participate in the program and which I encourage, of course, you all to, to listen uh, on the podcast or online on YouTube, etc. And uh, so finally, we're very grateful, of course, I want to say one last word to the Ecole des Arts Décoratifs uh, for allowing us to be here in this space, for also collaborating on our program. Uh, and I want to particularly thank 
uh, Patrick uh, uh, Lafond de Lojo, who is here, Francesca Cozzolino, uh, Jérôme Medic, and uh, Emmanuel Thibault, of course, for facilitating our collaboration. Tonight, I am delighted to be joined by the artist Irene Koppelman, um, who is currently the subject of an exhibition at the Mamak in Nice. So if you're in Nice, I encourage you all to visit that exhibition, and whose practice has involved, uh, for a long time, deep uh, cooperation with the scientific community and scientists, in particularly around their subjects of study, which range from bacteria to forests and to glaciers. Um, we'll see some images later on. As well as, of course, Richard Sennett, a renowned sociologist, a professor at Harvard and Columbia University, and senior advisor to the UN Programme for Climate Change in Cities, and who is a specialist among other things, among many things, on the subject of complex cooperation, in, uh, of on which he has written numerous books. And uh, I will be moderating discussion alongside Anna Bernagozzi, who is a professor here at the Ecole des Arts Décoratives de Paris, uh, who is also a curator and who is the publisher of a book uh, this year called Towards Sharing Common Futures, um, which of course I encourage you all to read, although it's already out of print, it's out of stock, that's how popular it's been, and uh, which is on the subject of co-design and inclusion. Um, so we'll be talking for about an hour and then there'll be some time for, for questions and also uh, some more time for questions at, at, at drinks just, uh, just next door. Anna? Stefano, thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction and uh, for the invitation to the Fondation Tali also and uh, also for to my colleagues uh, uh, Francesca Cozzolino and uh, um, Patrick Lafond Lojo uh, for the kind invitation to moderate the session. Um, Co-creation. So co-creation is, in my opinion, the only uh, methodology capable of valuing, guaranteeing the diversity of voices necessary for implementation of any project and action. But I think its epistemology uh, should be commonly revised. Artists and designers should become the co-creator of relational systems and uh, uh, tools uh, with complex ecosystem capable of triggering new forms, allowing the approval of social cohesion as a whole, stimulating and cultivating diversity and critical thinking, and catalyzing the positive resources needed to address today's environmental, social, and cultural disaster, and this uh, through uh, horizontal and systemic models involving the social body as a whole. To cooperate with the living, which is the theme that we will treat today, uh, need that we as educators uh, become uh, multidisciplinary. And we put this at the heart of our practices. We have to relearn to collaborate in, the in an unprecedented way and uh, across borders and professions. And we have to be capable, of course, uh, to live uh, and to work uh, for and with non-human agents and to deal with probably the most important challenging issue of our time. Stefano, uh, now I let you introduce our first guest. Thank you, Anna. Um, so maybe I can show some images. Voila, so this is an image of the exhibition at the MAMAC. So Irene Koppelman, uh, so you were born in Argentina you studied at the School of Arts at the National University of Córdoba, where you studied painting as part of a two-year residency program at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. You began researching the representations of landscapes as recorded by the 18th and 19th century naturalists. And after several years of working with museum collections, you started researching the physical landscape through your own fieldwork, working in environmentally sensitive areas such as the Antarctica, Panama, or many alpine ecosystems, which necessitated an interdisciplinary approach that led you to form Ukba Foundation, together with the artist Mariana Castillo de Bal, a platform for, con for constructing dialogue between different fields of knowledge, especially with scientists, museums, universities, and libraries. And in this dialogue, we could say drawing is your tool for understanding the world around you, and art is your form of knowledge. So I just wanted to show a few images I don't know if you want to say two, three words about 
the images. Can you hear me? Or yeah, hi. Good evening. Uh, so the image we see here is a uh, part of the exhibition. The, it's now in a mamak, and these are drawings of. Um, so I basically was working there with two laboratories, working on two different marine models. One is called Botrylus, which is this, and another one is called Nematostella. So basically, these uh, two little creatures they are studied because they have a capacity of uh, regeneration and they are studied in the context of, in a way, try to be applied to health studies, cancer, aging. So these animals have a, a really crazy capacity of, like if, of regenerating you. So you cut them out and they basically regrow. So um, what Stefano is uh, showing are like different uh, outcomes of this uh, long term. I work in the lab for, in the two laboratories for about two years, uh, spending like about a week in each during this time, became part of the, uh, the laboratories, uh, part of the lab meetings, uh, very much part of the environment myself. And yeah, this is something else, this is connected to glaciers. Also outcome of a very long project with, uh, in Switzerland with the Institute for Glacier Studies. This is also part of it, uh, an institute also in Switzerland working with the um, trees studies, like glacier and avalanches invasive species so basically we're browsing through uh, just to show a, a little bit of all the kind of drawing work that you've that you've done in particular yeah. Irene obviously has worked on many different things and different mediums but drawing is is central to the practice so I thought that we would show a yeah. few examples this one is quite nice because we see sort of how you how you come to create these drawings yeah so these are my work environment. So this is in Panama, in the, it's, a, it's called Stride. It's part of a, it's a Smithsonian Tropical Studies Institute. And I did a lot of work also there. Work with lianas, work with mangroves, work with the invasive species. So I've been kind of recurrently going there, working with different teams for many years. And the first question I wanted to ask you was, of course, today we're in an art and design school. Um, where you know drawing is a is a crucial part of the the teaching here, and and what does for you does this fact of drawing allow both in the creative process as well as in the understanding of of living systems? So basically, I mean, drawing is um, uh, it's a way of accessing knowledge in a way for me. It's a tool, as you say yourself, understanding the world. And so for me, drawing is a lot more than the act of drawing itself. So I start drawing a lot before in a way. So for me, drawing has to do also with find, finding subject, uh, being in the situation, finding people to work with. So there is something very precious in the fact of drawing and uh, being dealing with uh, whatever I'm drawing. But there's also a lot of uh, things, processes occurring before. So the drawing starts in a way by entering these environments, uh, discussing with people, understanding the ecosystems, understanding the way the scientists work, how they work. And then the question comes of how to draw, what to draw. So there are many different elements in drawing. Or probably before, would you like to ask some question already to Irene? <laughs> About what she said? <laughs> Spontaneously. Well, I'm very, uh, does it work? Okay, uh, uh, I'm very sensible to what you say about drawing. It's a way of discovery, isn't it? And um, about it's a way of uncovering um, by making an image slowly and erratically because of how we use the hand. Uh, of something that if we were to make a photograph of it or put it on a computer would be already the problems would have been covered over. It would be a finished object. And uh, to me that the relationship between drawing and the kind of processes of nature are all one. That is that it's something when you draw you are uncovering a process rather than making a representation which is fixed. And that's what the natural world is about. Yeah, yeah that's exactly, I mean, that's what drawing is exactly yeah. for, for me. And it brings, 
back to your question also, uh, issue of duration. So there is a long-term engagement with your subject when you're trying to draw. And in that, you also unveil the yeah. some processes that have to do with nature. You know, the equivalent to that in music, I, I used to be a musician so long, long ago. The equivalent to that in music is that the, the work of a rehearsal is like drawing because you're seeing things get very erratic. They're not finished. Um, and in a way for musicians, the, you really understand a work when, when you encounter problems that can't be solved in a rehearsal. That's a kind of fundamental issue, not something that can be, of course, we always paper over in a performance. But the equivalent to drawing is finding something that doesn't get resolved when you practice, especially with other other people. And so there, there is a kind of analogy between what you do and what musicians do. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I, I also want to say that the, I mean, I'm very happy that Richard Sennett is here with us uh, because I, there is a lot uh, of uh, work done in um, art and science and there is a bit of a trend in working on art, art and science and art and nature, but there is very little say about the, the ethics. And I think that's for me has been very interesting in the work of Richard Sennett, like what is cooperation? How do we work to, and there is very little say about how to do it. So what, what, what's a good collaboration with science? What, how do you do it really? I mean, how do you do it well? So for me, it's uh, actually really important that uh, we bring this um, yeah. element into the conversation. Uh, are you ever unhappy about the word interdisciplinary? I loathe it. I think this is it, this is a bureaucrat's word because it assumes that there are distinct bodies of knowledge that intersect rather than something that's developed, really co-created. Um, I, I mean, I, that's been a to talk about climate change. That's been an enormous struggle for us in trying to deal more creatively with issues of climate change, that the notion that there's some kind, like a Venn diagram between different forms of knowledge, that's a terrible image because it's already, again, something where there's something finished and then you see where it in intersects. So to me, I mean, this, the, the metaphor of drawing is something that where you were really co-creating something without saying, I'm bringing a specialized knowledge to this, what do you know, and so on. That's proved deadly, I think, in a lot of, uh, at least from the kind of work we're trying to do in the UN, that's proved deadly because you, uh, it's... Um, it's sharing something that's already formed rather than making something happen. So I, I, I think what, uh, I mean, I think what climate change as a subject raises, which is how do we find a different way of understanding structure than there's this body of knowledge, there's that body of knowledge, and so on. Uh, that's not a structure, creative structure. So, Richard, just because I didn't introduce you properly, so now I'm going to do it very briefly, the, br the brief version, if you don't mind. <laughs> so Can everybody hear at the back, by the way? Is it a bit, a bit yeah. Can you hear? Can you speak a bit closer to the mic? Oh, like this? Better? Me, uh, Okay, Richard Sennett, so you are currently uh, serve as a senior advisor uh, of the United Nations on its program on climate change and citizens. And you have been working for more than 20 years on this issue, so you are really the big expert at telling us probably what to do. No, no, no. You are also <laughs> senior fellow of the Center of, on Capitalism and Society on, at Columbia University and professor of urban studies at Harvard. Uh, to go back to what we were saying uh, about uh, drawing uh, and uh, living and co-working with the, with the living, uh, in your trilogy 
your books, uh, which is The Craftman, Together and Building and Dueling, you assert that the craft of making physical things provides insight into the techniques of experience that can shape our dealings with others. It allows, what you were saying before, also about music, uh, to practice our relations with one another, learn skills, and anticipate and revision uh, in order to improve these relations. Do yeah. you think, as you said also before, that drawing helps into uh, improving these relations as a skill? So how do you uh, describe uh, drawing as a skill and the proper skills of drawing, if it's possible? Well, it's a, uh, it's a complicated question. I would say that any practice uh, which has an element, large element of uncertainty to it is more likely to be uh, something that people can share than something which is a, a, a closed system. And um, if I could just move away from the drawing thing for a moment, I think the problem with a lot of the work that we've been, we've been uh, doing uh, about climate change uh, hasn't really addressed the, res the, there's too much presentation of here are the facts and the politics is resisting them. Whereas the resistance in knowing about something should be inherent. I mean, for instance, take, take the kind of thing we're trying to do all the time, which is model what 1. now 1.65, we've given up on 1.5, uh, uh, what, what that, that rise in, in temperature entails. Most of what happens in arriving at that number, 1.65, is closing off a lot of very interesting elements in which we don't know anything about in order to arrive at a number. Uh, one example is what eth methane melt in Siberia, what effect it will have on global temperature. I know this is not a very sexy subject, uh, but it's an extremely important one. But when we try and arrive at a number which represents what that effect might be, we've closed off a, a great deal of the scientific and also imaginative thinking uh, about what methane is, how it spreads as a gas, uh, what is its relation uh, to the permafrost, Methane from cows is, you know, cow farts are a big source of methane. How do these two things relate? These are all problematized, uh, problematic issues which get resolved by these kind of numeric measures of how hot uh, uh, methane release is likely to be. So what I've been trying to do with my team is to get away from uh, representing what climate change is about in numeric terms and to find other more imaginative ways like what you've shown uh, which give us a different kind of insight rather than levels of, of, uh, uh, of change, particularly single number levels. And that's what most of the discourse about climate change is about. And it's a false knowledge. Any single number, how happy are you? 8.5? 8.7? You know, it's a false way of thinking about a complex system, which is much more open. So uh, I, I, just putting the drawing part of this way, the role of imagination in this is inseparable from breaking the kind of intellectual habit of uh, making a, a numerical assessments of climate change. We need, a, we need this kind of thinking rather than targets that focus on, on, on a number. Anyhow, that's, 
that's why our team, which is a lot of scientists, is trying to gradually think more like artists and less like statisticians. So that's sort of where I am. And, and maybe, Irene, would you like to, to react to that? I mean, to what he said, and, and more generally, what do you feel you can do as an artist, or, or whether purposefully or not, in terms of your work, in terms of your observation of these living processes, like Richard Sennett, in terms of drawing, um, and more generally in terms of the art creation, um, your collaboration with site. What, what do you feel like your role can be uh, in, in this matter? Well, I think it's exa exactly, w can you now hear or not in the back? Yeah? Is it okay? So, no, I think it's ex exactly what um, Richard is saying. It's saying, I mean, I think our role is to open up the image in the imagination or mental space to think uh, out of the box. So I don't think my role is so much to put a case across in terms of, uh, okay, yes, lianas are, or the glaciers are disappearing. Yeah, sure, they're disappearing. It's very sad and I see it while working with it, but uh, it's not exactly my role to, uh, yeah, to, to, to make a case, about, to put a case across. It's more to engage with, to engage with the teams I'm working with, to, to engage with the, the public, how you engage with the public, how you open up the idea of drawing to other people. So I think th those are like small battles that in a way they, they have to do with the way I prefer to, to play. Uh, a role in this, and and maybe maybe then you can talk us maybe about more of your role um, with, like you said, with working with maybe first with young people, and maybe then we can talk about about scientists. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about what we see here. So the images we see here is a, a drawing camp that I organize in uh, Argentina, uh, very close to the area where I'm from. It's a national park. So basically, I, I was working in a, towards a show in, a, in Buenos Aires. So I, again, was working again with uh, many, many different time, uh, teams of scientists. So I knew the um, ecology of that area very well, which happened to be the area where I started making my drawings when I was a young student without having an insight into the ecology. So I was working with people that knew about, um, I don't know, fungi, the relation of uh, earth with the roots, the uh, litter with the uh, earth. So basically we decided to do uh, this drawing cup where, where everyone would go and draw. So scientists were going in the morning giving a little talk about one issue that concerned the landscape and then I articulated drawing exercises. And then we spend the re rest of the day drawing. And everyone who would go there would draw. No one was there as a witness. So the scientists would draw, the children would draw, the parents of the children would draw. So the issue of uh, not knowing how to draw was not uh, allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so you are there, you draw, or you are not there. And uh, it was quite interesting. And one of my main points was also that uh, we were drawing things that were not uh, very visible. So we were drawing lichens, uh, mushrooms, uh, ants, or the results of the ants in the landscape. So trying to bring up the, the idea that the, the landscape we see, the, sh the shape we see, is a result of a, of a process, basically, that there are many things happening while we are there drawing. And is there something particular about drawing that, um, that was particularly powerful, you thought, uh, in this process? Well, I, I do truly believe that there is something else that gets activated because uh, you engage differently. You give time, you have to think how to do it. You are cold or not cold, there are mosquitoes, so the, you feel the environment very differently. So you understand you're part of it as well, you're affected by it. So all those things happen when you draw. Richard, um, I'm referring here to your book Together. And to, the, and to the work of Irene. The attentive and generative uh, open-ended work that she's presented to us, uh, or experience, as she also said, um, 
do you think it seems to you it seems that uh, I, I would call it dialogical as you write in uh, in your book and probably also the ambiguity of this program of this program of, of the process that Irene presents uh, acts I think uh, like the conjunctive uh, that you say that according to you should be used uh, to invite the other to respond leaving space for differences in perspective Does this analogy uh, with regard to Irene's work make sense to you? Um, in your opinion, which cooperat cooperative skills are present also in Irene's work? To go back to this point. Uh, you ask me these very complicated questions. <laughs> If I could just uh, cycle Before back to judge. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, usually the term dialogical is just applied, is applied to an ongoing process, which doesn't have a narrative beginning, middle, and end, but something which is an, un, which is an open-ended pr process. Uh, if I speak more particularly about this with the work we've been doing in climate change, it applies in the following way. Um, the Almost all the cooperative work that the UN has to do between its various components on, uh, around the climate uh, means dealing with people who you don't like, who you don't understand, or whom you simply don't know. So that it's a, a problematic and often very aversive uh, relationship. Uh, that's because we're orientated to member states, and member states don't, uh, no more than in wars, they don't agree on, on climate change issues. So the problem for us on this is to break the model of, of taking a set of propositions on which everybody can agree. That hasn't proved through the various COPs very productive, now, they, whether the COP, all these COP meetings since Paris have been productive or not is something we can discuss and you'll hate seeing me cry in public if I give you my true, true uh, uh, answer to that question. But do you understand what the problem is? This is complex cooperation because as it were, you can't be on the same page. And so the dialogical process in most of the negotiations we have is to find some way to break uh, this, uh, break through this complexity. And one of the ways that we've found to do that is by a set of diplomatic moves which are very, uh, rather than declarative, are, sub are conjunctive. It might be the case that you might say that, would you agree to something like that? This seems like a lot of trimming in the British sense of the word, that you're actually evasing, evading things. But in dealing with climate change, that's the nature of the beast because you're dealing with people who have very, very different economic and political interests in it. And for us, the question is what kind of cooperation can still hold the threads of this discussion together? Um, it's why uh, there was a, after the Paris meetings, which were really the crucial meetings for the UN and climate change, why there's been so much evasion, half-truths, things that seem very weak, and so on. Because if we had um, to do a kind of confrontational kind of meeting, we simply wouldn't have any meetings. People would just withdraw. That's the situation we're in. I know it's very, very frustrating to the public But our notion is to keep, as it were, to keep the door open. And often the only way you can keep the door open is uh, 
by taking this um, detour, um, what's the word in French? Uh, uh, detour, uh, where you... A not a, a detour. To something which seems like, oh, you've lost the plot. But in fact, the plot of taking a, a detour um, is, is the notion that it allows people to stay in a relationship with each other. If I could just say one more thing about this. The problem with this is time. Because we haven't got much time left. And these modes of diplomatic um, interaction to keep the door open are against something. Already we're seeing that there are unstoppable effects of climate change, which are going to happen no matter what human beings do or not. And the time frame is shrinking. And to me, the frustration has been how to keep a, a process of negotiation going when uh, that process is kind of luxury, increasingly a, a luxury of time. So we have much time left. I, I went to Pakistan during the floods, and it just struck me then that we'd been predicting this would happen or something like it for a long time. It happened. In a way, negotiation became beside the point at that. A third of Pakistan was underwater, you know. So that's the kind of tension of this. I certainly don't think that what the UN does is irrelevant, but we're moving into a kind of world in and again, it's a world that we have to imagine rather than summon up by prediction in, in, which, in which we're pushed in a way which means that comp cooperation becomes beside the point. Um, uh, anyhow, uh, so I'm glad you're thinking about cooperation, but what I know about it is that it doesn't mean agreeing with other people. It's much more complex than that, and that it has a time, it, it's a time bomb. And at a certain point, it'll become irrelevant. Yeah, and this, uh, you, you also citing together the cat of Montaigne. Oh, the cat of Montaigne. <laughs> Do you know about this? You've all read your Montaigne. Oh, well, they're art students. Uh, you should know this. This is a, you've got to know this. This is a famous thing in Montaigne about his cat. He's looking at his cat and he's saying, well, what does this cat really think about me? Not what do, does this cat think, but what is it thinking about me? I can never know it. It's a great, uh, it's a great model for making art. That's what that's what stimulates us, right? There's something there where the other is present, and the other is is making a judgment on you which you could never know. That that is a kind of stimulation to make something out out of that kind of Montaigne cat situation. Uh, and this is not an original thought to me. This was actually Nietzsche who had, had this idea that I want to create when I can't communicate. Which express how difficult it is to cooperate, to go back to, is it possible? But you work cooperatively, it seems to me, in a, in a, in a rather more e uh, straightforward way. These are, these are acts of... of mm. Yeah, I mean, yes and no, because it takes a lot of time to build up these situations. So I need to also understand the environments very well, for which I need to work a lot of time with the scientists. Yeah. Otherwise, I cannot articulate the drawings neither. So it's actually quite slow, and the issue of time is, uh, is something I kind of defend. I kind of resist to rush because of the quality, but it's also obviously a problem that 
what you mentioned, no? that there is something that is becoming urgent. And so it's always a little bit of a fight uh, that I have in within my own projects, no? Yeah. Like, do you want to be efficient? But I kind of resist to be efficient because I know it's, it doesn't bring quality. Do you, can you imagine some way of structuring these group projects where you could get more quickly at something which opens? I, I am totally sympathetic to this, but is there a way you can cut through that? No. I don't think so, no. It, because every, what basically what uh, I'm searching in those projects are also drawing qualities. So f that takes a lot of time also. So I, in a way, corner myself into finding new drawing solutions, given by every time a new environment. And that uh, takes a lot of time. Well, this is, I think, a difference between what you do and I do. Because I would say the quality of these interactions that um, that I'm involved in <coughs> excuse me, is very low. And I don't care about that. I neither do, m yeah. well, my colleagues care, but, but, I I but do you know what I mean? Just to have, uh, uh, to get uh, the Russia, for instance, to even talk about methane, even if it's, uh, it's nonsense what they say, at least they're talking. So for us, we have a different kind of set of, uh, I mentioned Russia because that's, that's a huge, the tundra melt is a, a huge, huge issue. But it's, it's to keep the, the, the process going. And you often do that by junk, by junk talk. You know, they talk junk, you talk junk back to them, and so on, but you're in the same room. Whereas if you speak truth to power, in this realm, it's over. You know? If somebody were, I, I should get off Russia, if someone were to say to a country which had an uncontrolled, um, consumption of energy. Let's take another country. Uh, you know, this is a moral horrible, you should be ashamed, you should stop immediately. Everything you've told us is a pack of lies. Um, that country would say bye-bye and we would have nothing. So I, it's a very, but it's a very fundamental pro uh, problem in complex negotiations which is that the quality of the discourse is irrelevant, whereas for you it isn't. Maybe it's helpful, Eden, if you want to talk a little bit more about your process and then maybe that's an interesting way for you to be able to respond more clearly to... So this is one of your, your two, uh, the two laboratories you, you worked with in Nice, uh, ahead of the Mamak exhibition. Maybe um, I'll go through some images I have the, the both and you can talk a little bit what we see. So, well, this is one of the little creatures I was working with. It's, call, it's called Botrilos, and it's a, it's a marine model. It's uh, very close to us, genetically, but it has this uh, amazing capacity of regeneration. So, mm. basically, they study them with the hope of finding some solution for something we cannot do, which is, I mean, regenerate. <laughs> they don't die, basically, we do. So, this is part of the work I was doing there, and this is, part of the processes that take a lot of time, which is trying to find a way to, to draw. So first I need to understand the biology. I need to also learn how to take care of these animals because they are alive. So they need to be fed, they need to be clean, they need to live in certain quality of water. So that's all part of the process for me as well. And then how to draw it. It comes kind of parallel to it. Uh, what's the base, best way to draw it? And yeah, this is a series of watercolors, which is one of the solutions. I did a series of uh, seal screens on glass, which kind of brought the, um, in a way, the somehow the movement of the animal. This is the other one, the Matostela. So this is a, another family of animals, but it has the same quality. So I work with uh, two laboratories. One, this is solitary. 
And this little animal, if you cut it in two, uh, after a week you have two animals. Is that uh, that efficient? So basically, I was very interested in the in some issue of uh, movement. They keep moving. So as someone who makes drawing, I was kind of uh, trying to find a way how to draw it, and then I decide to to work on this um, motion, let's say. So these are part of the drawings. Like every, it took 25 minutes every drawing, and then every minute has a line. So I created the protocol, <coughs> and then once the protocol was uh, established, I did a quite a large series of uh, drawings. So depending on the the life the animal was having at the moment, the the, <coughs> the outcome in the in the drawings. What is very interesting is that er Eric Rottinger, which was uh, the scientist you were working with, uh, it was really excited about, about your project and said, uh, starting from that uh, uh, and from this uh, and from these drawings, uh, we uh, understand new paths our research can go to, and we can sh we have to share it again with other scientists. So it's a kind of a chain that you are triggering, which is highly necessary i would say today <laughs> i mean those things happen yeah not all the time but sometimes mm -hmm. happen and it's, it's it's nice when it happens because the emotion is something they were not looking at they were not very interested and because i was trying to find a way to enter to the subject matter so through drawing i started looking at the motion i started asking then we did a whole experiment in which i drew the motion then we i mean they cut it and then i follow the movement while it regenerate to see if it moves more or less or the same, and what happened after it regenerates, what's the movement. So yeah, sometimes it, it in the best case scenario it happens, mm -hmm. but it does take a lot of time because they, they need to understand how I work also yeah. to be able to enter my process. I need to understand how they work. So it's, yeah, it's not really efficient. Does it work smoothly and, and do they accept you? They normally do. they do? see the value in you being there and, and is there a is there a complex cooperation that you have to surmount or does it work quite straight is it quite straightforward no there is a lot of uh, i mean a lot of uh, communication has to happen because there is a lot of um, i mean we are very different basically the backgrounds are very different i'm thinking about drawing they're thinking about biology so we need to find the and for them sometimes it's hard that things don't look the way they are for them or i don't draw the tentacles and for them the tentacles are very important so I have to explain a lot. I have to sometimes draw the tentacles so they see the drawing doesn't work as drawing. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, if it, but it works, but um, it takes time. <laughs> mm, my last question, probably to Senate, and then we will give the floor to the question of the public. What do you think? Um, in your concept of the open city, uh, you advocate. Uh, for its incomplete form and you say that the role of the designer is that of creating a physical physical forms of a particular sort that they are incomplete these incomplete forms that adapt over time are democratic spaces where, where strangers interact can you give us some hints about the identity of these strangers and their role in the co-creation project or in the open city at large? Um, well, what I had in mind for, if I could just wind back a second, I mean, a lot of the urban development that we've seen in the last 20 years is of closed urban forms, that is of housing that's, I give you an example in China, that the spurt of housing development in China in the 90s, of mass housing, was under the aegis of the one family, uh, one child policy in families. So the apartments were, uh, were very small. Uh, and the, the World Bank financed a lot of, of this development on the notion that China wanted to reduce its population. Well, 20 years later, the 
the society has changed in a different way. They're, it's now very aging. They need younger people. But the housing that we financed is not easily convertible to this new kind of way of of of, of living and 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 of uh, uh, rearing children. So m my notion in the open city was simply that we need to create uh, with things like housing forms um, uh, a more flexible and fluid kind of housing development. And this usually uh, involves something that bankers in particular hate, which is that you have excessive or redundant uh, capacities built into the, into the physical structure so that it can change. If, to bring this down to a very, very elemental level, it's if you have just the most efficient minimal plumbing stack, and then you change the configuration of, of the house, then you have to, it costs a lot of money to, to undo this. So that's what the open city idea is about. It's about to recover, if I put it in architectural terms, to recover from the notion that there's a tight fit between form and function, to loosen that tight fit, uh, to uh, create waste wasted space, wasted uh, capacities, and so on, uh, in order to be socially adaptive. And the same thing, I think, is true for dealing with climate change. There is no one optimal form, which again is suitable to a number like 2.3. We're going to have to have many different ways of building housing and streets and uh, public buildings um, that because climate change is it's the end we know what what it's going to be but the the pathways are very uncertain and so i've been arguing that what is true say in the familial sphere is also true in the in the climate sphere as well, that we have to create openly uh, the kinds of cities that can be very adaptive. This is very different from smart city concepts like those in um, Songdo in, 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 in uh, South Korea, which are uh, a kind of over-determined maximal uh, intrusion into uh, energy use daily and sometimes hourly. That is, uh, you can't travel yet for another two hours because the system is, is, is using too much energy if you do. In place of that kind of overdetermined relationship, which is really based on kind of equilibrium, uh, uh, we, we need to have things which are more wasteful. And the I ironic to me, the irony of this is the more that we have built waste, the more we're going to be able to deal with waste in the, in the in environment. And as, as I say, this is in, um, when, I, when I went to Pakistan, I mean, I saw all these buildings which couldn't adapt. They were beautiful buildings, many of them, but they're simply, didn't, th there's no give in them in terms of something nobody expected, which was the particular ways in which the floods uh, took form in, in Pakistan. So that's, that's a kind of paradox, that if we, if we create wasteful buildings in the sense of more than we need, we'll, I think, be able to better deal with climate change. This is my own view. Uh, this is not official policy, <laughs> hardly. Um, uh, if you say to somebody in the World Bank, waste more money, the, the response is, well, yes, you're a college professor, yes, yes. We don't do things like that. But anyhow, that's, that's, that's I think, where we're, we're at 
with this. We have to really, it's again a question of reimagining what an environment is. And we've got to get away from utilitarian ideas about what is a good environment in order to deal with this very anarchic thing, which is changes in the climate. And I heard also you talking about the 15-minute city, They're saying that it's, it's not a, a real model for you. No. Absolutely not, because it creates ghettos. Can you explain a little bit on how... Oh, that's <laughs> another story. I mean, if you're a, an haute bourgeois, the notion that you can walk or cycle for 15 minutes is great. But if you are a poor Mexican worker and the factory where you work is uh, on the other side of town, a 15-minute city is meaningless to you. And for as you go down the class scale, um, the poorer people are to find work in many of the cities that we deal with, the longer they have to commute. So that's why we're arguing for public, better public transport rather than smaller cities. It, but that's a practical issue. You know, that's what that's about. Maybe, maybe we open up questions to the audience. Also, Irene, if you have, or if, if you have any questions for each other, uh, that's also possible. Uh, are, are there any, is there any questions? Anybody in the audience would like to? Yes? Thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Uh, uh, I'd like to go back to the notion of re regeneration. Because you didn't talk very much about the idea of uh, the notion of regeneration. So is it more in your practice the representation of regeneration or is it about using materials who, as you said, regenerate themselves? So this is the first question about the social responsibility here. Uh, they are designer and in creation, how they can use new materials or you know help them to think about the way they can produce differently. So the concept of generation and uh, holistically, more uh, globally, uh, for another question for Richard Senet, uh, is it uh, possible to? <laughs> be a, a little bit more aligned about uh, how we can uh, regenerate what we destroy for like half century and how cannot uh, be aware of uh, that it's a real emergency and why the public uh, policy uh, is not more accurate of uh, dealing about the rebuilding uh, forest and etc. So I, at what I think is it's more uh, efficiency in the private uh, initiative, uh, for example, investor support innovations, and it's very agile, agile, agile much more than in the public, uh, you know, the policies, uh, etc. So as you are an expert in this area, I'd like to hear you about. Uh, uh, do you believe in the innovation, supporting the innovation, or degrowth, or both? So this is the question for Richard. And you, it's about regeneration. <laughs> voilà. Sorry, it's a little bit long. So in, in that project in particular, I was working, it's mainly, a, it's not a symbol of anything. It's basically, a, I was, it's the context of a fundamental research, as they call it in science. So it's a, what they call fundamental research, and they work in, in a very particular things that are is the DNA of these animals that have the capacity of regenerate, which happen to have a very similar DNA of us. So if they can do that, those little animals, maybe we can too, as human beings, not as an ecosystem, not in terms of ecology. We as human beings maybe can cure cancer or can regenerate an organ that we lost or <laughs> that kind of application. So it's not applied to ecological issues, more it's in the context of uh, health. So that's that particular, that particular project. And I have worked with ecologists as well, of course. I mean, I have worked with people studying lianas, uh, forests, glaciers, some things I guess can regenerate, some things cannot, in terms of ecology. 
No, well, well, that's very interesting. It is an ecological issue, regeneration. Yeah. It is. It is, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and we are part of the ecology anyway. Yeah, no, but I mean, there, there could be something uh, that, for instance, regenerating forests yeah. could come out of thinking about this at a cellular level. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so if you, you leave are it, dealing with climate change. No, no, f for sure. And I have worked with Lianas and the context of those studies are, I mean, what happened with the forest if you don't touch it anymore? Does it reconstruct itself? You're right, exactly. Can it reconstruct? Can it not? So I, I'm dealing very often with uh, people studying those things. Yeah. Very, very often. Sounds yeah. It sounds, it, it sounds very positive. V very briefly, I would, how do you choose your subject how did you end up at this lab in particular studying on how yeah well that lab in particular was a bit exceptional so i more often often work with people working in the field with issues of uh, more related to ecology so i'm a lot more i'm that's more, more my subject kind of and with this particular lab it, it was a series of uh, coincidence i had worked with invasive species and i came across these little animals then and yeah, it's a very old uh, marine station in Villefranche, so I wanted to work with them. And there is also a, a another part of it, of my process, which is finding people that I would like to work with. Yeah. So I normally interview 10 teams, and then I settle for someone that I feel there is space for communication. That's also a big part of it. So that lab was very, uh, they were curious about art, they understood art could have an agency. So I, I decide to sit <laughs> sit there. Um, my own personal, this is just my own personal opinion, uh, and uh, ab about the question you ask about growth, which is, I think it um, it's an extreme. What we need is more redistribution rather than more growth. I, what I know absolutely about this is we can't grow ourselves out of climate change. That is, uh, and I would say that there's a, uh, there has to be a lot of inventiveness. And I wouldn't say that, you know, it's an entrepreneurial, but it's a, it's a kind of social entrepreneurship. But the notion that growth is a necessity to solve social problems. Is uh, I'm just speaking personally about this. Is to me malign. We we need more. We need more distribu redistribution of the resources we we have. It rather saddened me. I, I've just retired from the UN, so I can speak freely about this. It saddened me at Sharm El Sheikh that the. Re Cop, oh, sorry, COP27, that the fund that uh, rich countries have promised to the poor is for the poor to develop, to, to stimulate their growth, rather than to think about ways that they can deal with the situation at hand, which is that they're at risk. I think it's protect them from damage. It, I think the, the money is protect them from damage, flood, uh, heat. Uh, it's not to grow, it's just to survive. Uh, that's what it should be. That's what it should be. In fact, uh, this is something where the discourse and the reality is quite different. I'm, I'm trying to put this in a in a in a diplomatic <laughs> way uh, um, and you know the the what's been driving a lot of of this as you know for a long time is that uh the model of development that has been presented to re poor countries is a model that f no matter what's said about it is basically a model of capitalist development. Uh, and that's, uh, 
you have to become more capitalistic in order to be to have a better quality of life and um which i th personally again i think is is wrong but um this fund uh is not quite what it's it's cracked up to be but i think the general principle about this and i think most ecologists would agree with this is that the bigger we make a system uh the more problems we're going to have in it if you put uh, a thousand new coal factories uh, coal processing factories in india you uh which is what's on the cards uh it will stimulate a certain kind of economic development, but of course also uh, create climate problems. What's not being thought is how could we use that money to create a different kind of uh, economic pattern which would benefit people but doesn't count as growth as we usually uh, think about it in terms of GDP, for instance. So. Um, but as I say, this is my own, if I looked at this sociologically in the broad context, to me what we need to imagine is what does it mean to redistribute resources we already have. Um, uh, you know, in the, starting it with mining, for instance, in the Renaissance, the notion was that nature was, uh, inexhaustible it was a cornucopia and we know that's not tr we know that's not true anymore uh, but we don't act that that way and um, that's part of the problem of what's happening with the in this relationship between uh, so-called developing and developed uh, countries there is no more cornucopia you know, but uh, developing countries often think there must be, and that's uh, that's part of this problem. Um, anyhow, this is a long discussion. We probably have to close, but if anybody has, does anybody have a, a last burning question? Yes. Okay. Is it quick? Thank you so much. Not a question, but mostly thank you for this presentation and because I'm working on monitoring and evaluation for climate change adaptation so I have I'm supposed to be more focused on figures and metrics and everything yeah. but I'm more and more fond of uh, other approaches like uh, narratives and theory of change everything so I think that's definitely very useful and definitely we should because you, you have linkages with the scientists but maybe we should try to promote linkages with the uh, engineers, well, artists, engineers, consulting company, all this you know, stuff to help reinvent and uh, design other ways and other futures. So that's, uh, but that's quite helpful and inspiring. So, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much to our, to our two panelists and to Anna Benagotti as well. Uh, everybody give a round of applause to our speakers. <laughs> It, it was a pleasure to, to have you both here. Um, you can, if you have any questions that you haven't managed to ask, we will have a drink. On va prendre un verre à côté pour ceux qui veulent continuer la discussion. Et voilà, I just wanted to finally, again, thank uh, l'École des Arts Décoratifs for, for this evening. Thanks uh, to Fondation Tali, uh, Julien, Jenna, Nathalie, for uh, organizing this program. Uh, we have, um, a talk every month. So the next talk at the Ecole des Arts Decoratifs will be the 11th of January with uh, Ecologic Studio, is a, um, a design and architecture firm who uh, work a lot on bio design. So I invite you all to, to come to that. After that, we will have uh, Suzanne Husky, who's an artist, and um, Geneviève Prouveau, who's a feminist writer, and they will be uh, here uh, in February. And then in March, we have uh, Frédéric Aitwaiti, um, theater maker and um, historian of science, 
who will be speaking to Patrick Bouchon, uh, architect, about the, 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 these, the last two talks will be in French, uh, the, the Ville de Demain, uh, the, the city of tomorrow. So anyway, so hopefully you will see you there. Uh, thank you very much and uh, bonsoir à tous. <laughs>